Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Institute of Emerging Market Studies uh, webinar on saving globalization, uh, global value chains in East Asia after the pandemic. Uh, I'm Donald, I'm the director of the Institute, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to say a few words before I introduce uh, both our speakers. As we all know, global value chains have been a key part of the growth of China and East Asia over the last 30 years. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has generated a wave of pessimism over the prospects of globalization and the sustainability and future prospects of these value chains. Uh, many have already argued that the pandemic is likely to shorten or at least restructure uh, these global value chains as governments, as multinational enterprises are pressured to bring home uh, bring production home or closer to home. And of course, the picture is complicated by the fact that there is an ongoing US-China trade and technology con conflict, uh, and that's leading to concerns over technology bifurcation and the sort of risks that this might, this might pose to global value chains. So in this webinar, we're going to discuss uh, how might global value chains be reconfigured uh, and or, or might they be shortened after the pandemic? What are the likely impacts on current global value chains, especially in this part of Asia, uh, this part of developing East Asia, uh, which has benefited hugely from global value chains in the last 30 years? And more contemporarily, how will digital technologies uh, transform production and distribution processes? And to what extent would te technology bifurcation uh, be a challenge and be a threat uh, to existing global value chains? And finally, how should governments position themselves, governments in this region, position themselves for the opportunities and challenges ahead. I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers, our two panelists. Uh, the first who will uh, kick off our webinar would be Dr. Ko Ho Yi, who is the Chief Economist at EMRO. EMRO stands for the ASEAN Plus Three Macroeconomic Research Office. Uh, Ho Yi oversees EMRO's work on macroeconomic and financial market surveillance of its member economies, which of course comprise the 10 ASEAN economies and China, Japan, and South Korea. Our discussant today is uh, Manu Baskaran. Uh, Manu is a partner of the Centennial Group International and the founding director and CEO of Centennial Asia. So without further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Dr. Ko. Over to you, Hoi. Uh, thank you, Donald. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so as uh, Donald mentioned, uh, the topic of my presentation today is the global value chain in the post-pandemic new normal. Uh, some of you who follow us uh, may know that uh, this is part of a flagship report that we produce. Uh, usually there are two parts to the flagship report. Uh, the first part is on the uh, sh short-term global uh, not, regional outlook. And the second part is a thematic study which uh, looks at the structural challenges uh, facing the region. So this is part of a series of studies we've been doing over the years. Uh, and this year we decided to uh, focus on this topic uh, because of the, as uh, Donna say, uh, it's been under stress because of the disruption that is caused around the world. And there have been a lot of calls to ensure the, the supply chain. And as we know, the global value chain has been a main driver of growth in the region. So we decided that it's an important uh, issue and we should take a closer look at it. Uh, but the other thing that the pandemic has done is also what we call a flight to digital. Uh, and we saw that, uh, you know, in the increase in the use of digital technology, the increase in e-commerce and all that. So it is also a fundamental change. Uh, it basically highlighted the role of technology in terms of restructuring the value chain. But as we all know, uh, technology is now a very hot topic. Uh, it's a subject of... Uh, uh, rivalry between the US and China. So uh, there's a lot of concern about how this might lead to technology bifurcation and what implication it may have for you know, the global economy and also for, for this part of the world. So, so that's the, rest, the motivation for looking at this topic. Uh, so basically this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to run through uh, the report. Uh, the first part is on the GVC development. And then uh, I'll take a, a look at how the region will be affected by the reconfiguration of the global value chain. And then look at the impact of technology on the global value chain and the issue of 
the dispute between the US and China and how that might play out going forward and end up with a few key, key takeaways. <clears throat> So I'm going to chart, start with this chart on the left hand side. Uh, some of you may have seen this chart before. Uh, it's basically trade over global GDP uh, <clears throat> and also trade over regional GDP. You know? the, the one in, in gray is for the global economy and the one in, in blue is for the region. And basically the, the trend is the same. They sort of peak around 2009, 2010 and then things will flatten off. You know? Uh, and a lot of people have taken this to mean that, you know, there's a trend towards deglobalization, right? Uh, and <clears throat> on the right hand side, uh, we see pretty much the same thing, but this on the, on the global value chain participation, it also peaked around 2010, 2011, and then uh, <clears throat> declined slightly before picking up in the last two years, uh, just right before the pandemic hit. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, there's been a trend towards uh, a lot of people interpret this as uh, deglobalization, and that's not surprising because if you look at the chart on the left hand side, tariff rates has been coming down, and that's the the, the black line that we see. You know? uh, but in but in, in but in return, non-tariff barriers have been going up, and this is shown by the bar, uh, the red and the blue bar, and they have been going up. Uh, you know, over time. So although tariff rate has come down, uh, countries have raised non-tariff barrier against all kinds of imports, you know. And I think the biggest culprit here really is the uh, US. Uh, they have probably the most number of anti-dumping, uh, you know, suit against other countries. Uh, <clears throat> so so for sure there's a, a trend towards anti-globalization. Uh, we see that in the populist movement in Europe, but also in the US. Uh, and, and so, you know, this chart basically shows that there's been a, a raising of the bar against uh, globalization. And on the right, uh, we have indices of wages. The one at the very bottom is uh, the United States. And you can see that it's pretty flat, right? And so I think there's been an you know, attack against uh, globalization that, you know, it's caused uh, hollowing out of the uh, manufacturing sector that is taking away wages and basically cause wages to stagnate in the US. Whereas when you look at wages in the, the uh, region, uh, especially in China, uh, it's been growing at a relatively uh, rapid clip. So certainly there's this uh, resentment against globalization that has been an unfair uh, regime. <clears throat> so we look at the uh, exports of the countries in the region. Uh, the, on the left hand side, uh, we break down the, sh the value added in exports uh, by, <clears throat> and, and surprisingly enough, uh, what you see is that the domestic value added share is quite large. Uh, for the ASEAN country, it ranges between 60 to 70%. And for China, it's almost 90%. No? Uh, a bit surprising because most people would think that uh, you know, a lot of the export from, from the region is comprising low value added electronic products and all that. But this is not, um, so what, the reason why is the domestic value added is so high is because a lot of these exports are done by foreign enterprises and the value added of the foreign enterprises are, are, are in the national account treated as domestic value added. So that accounts for the very high level of domestic value added in, the, in total exports. Uh, but, or, if you look at the chart on the right hand side, uh, what you see is that the sales by US uh, MNCs in China has been rising very rapidly over the years. Whereas their export to China from outside has basically stagnated uh, you know, in the last several years. Uh, and this is an interesting trend because uh, it shows that increasing a lot, more and more of the US uh, MNCs are attracted to the region, not because of using the region as an export base, but because of the domestic demand in the region. So domestic re demand has become the major uh, attraction for many of the enterprise uh, you know, to move to China uh, instead of using China as a cheap export platform for export of, uh, of uh, many. So the, 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 the reason for you know, 
investing in China has shifted over the years from, from export to, to, to catering to the domestic market. So we now look at the implication of uh, you know, this disruption on the region. Uh, how is going to affect the restructuring of the global value chain? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, uh, you know, this is a, a study by McKinsey, and it shows that uh, the ASEAN plus three region basically will account for about 42% of urban consumption uh, in from 2015 to 2030, uh, which is the biggest uh, slice of the pie, you know, uh, and that's why a lot of MNCs are now being attracted to the region. They are attracted to, to produce for the, uh, the market here in the region. And I think this was in our pro previous report. We call that the shift from factory Asia to shopper Asia. Um, and especially for luxury products, uh, as we all know, China has become the number one uh, you know, market in the world for luxury products. Uh, on the supply side, uh, you know, we look at the uh, the supply chain, and it turns out that because of the over the years, China has developed a very deep and uh, com complex ecosystem to support the manufacturing production. And so, even if, if that's why it's very easy to move to China because all your suppliers are there, right? And it's not so easy to pull out from China because when you leave, you don't have the, uh, the suppliers uh, because they don't necessarily want, will follow you. And then there's a challenge of uh, reshoring uh, the experience from companies which have reshored, you know, moved back to the US, have been quite mixed. Some of them, you know, have been quite successful, but there are also many others that have had difficulty mo moving back uh, to the home country again. So I guess what, what this shows is that uh, is the attraction of the region for MNCs is still very strong. And, and, and it's because of two reasons. One is on the demand side, because the region has become a big market in itself. And secondly, because of the deep supply chain that has developed in the region. Also, surveys have been conducted you know, of uh, US multinational, and about 70% of the, the, the companies basically have no plan uh, to move. Uh, and even 30% of them have planned to expand further, which is not surprising. And for those, uh, only about 5.6% of the companies have any plan for de-risking. And if you look at the, the, the chart on the left-hand side, uh, for those who want to de-risk, you know, uh, the main strategy is to have diversify. So have dual sourcing of uh, raw materials, or they will increase inventory of critical products, or, ex or move to a, uh, another location which is close by. Um, to move back to the, to the ho home country, uh, only 15% of those uh, who, you know, who consider that, and that's the one at the very bottom. <clears throat> so we look at the, the, the figures and the region is still attracting a lot of uh, investment, uh, mostly going into manufacturing but also into other areas, sales office, obviously, because of the mark of the region as a, you know, a big market for products, but also regional headquarters are being set up here and business services. Uh, being... And on the left and right hand side, uh, we look at the investment coming into the ASEAN region and also into uh, Korea and Japan. And what we found is that a lot of the investment really is uh, from within the region itself. Uh, China has, has emerged as a major investor now. Uh, that's the red bar you see on the right side. Um, the gray bar are investors that are based in China that are investing outside China now in, in the region. <clears throat> so we also look at the you know uh, nine indicators, uh, this, which are usually used to. Uh, to rate whether a country is attractive for investment. Uh, and so this is a heat map. Uh, the greener you are, the more attractive you are. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the region, you know, Malaysia stands at the very top together with China. But the region as a whole, when you compare with other regions, you know, is 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 relatively attractive. Uh, so you know, so if MNCs were to consider where to relocate, uh, you know, the indicators would, would indicate that 
depending on the type of products they want to produce, uh, you know, the region will be one of the, the, the major destination. <clears throat> Okay, so now we come to the second part of the thematic study, which is on the impact of technology on the reconfiguration of the global value chain. So we already, I already mentioned that because of the pandemic, you know, it has spurred a flight to digital. And you see that with the chart on the left-hand side, where online sales have basically taken off, uh, that's the red line. Uh, whereas the traditional retail sales, the gray line, uh, you know, has taken a big uh, battering uh, during the, the pandemic. And they're only just now beginning to recover. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, I think the flight to digital is, is, is very evident and it's, and it's here to stay. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we just look at telemedicine and, you know, again, you know, that has benefited uh, greatly from the uh, lockdown. <clears throat> so, we believe that uh, going forward, uh, it's not only uh, <clears throat> all kinds of uh, new technology will come on, on stream, which are going to revolutionize the production process, uh, particularly robotics, automation, 3D printing, 3D printing, internet of things, the blockchain, you know. So the production process itself will be uh, reconfigured, uh, much more automated for sure, and, make, and, uh, and taking advantage of the new technology, the 5G together with Internet of Things. So you really have totally automated uh, factories now. Uh, run, and that would further hollow out actually the, the, the labor uh, uh, input into the production process. And it will also affect the shipping and logistics sector, um, you know, uh, especially with blockchain uh, and also data analytics. Uh, so, you know, I think the whole chain, the supply chain will be uh, greatly affected by the new technology that's coming on, coming on stream, uh, including trade financing, uh, you know, through so the traditional finance, trade financing where, you know, uh, an exporter will go to the bank and get a, a, a letter of credit. I think all that will be disintermediated by fintech and, and, and modern technology. <clears throat> but as I mentioned, uh, you know, Increasingly, you know, uh, there is this that rivalry between the U.S. and China. I think the the, the U.S. have sort of uh, come to the realization that China is ahead of <laughs> of catching up very rapidly uh, with the U.S. on many fronts in technology, and it's determined to slow down the process. Uh, so they have imposed all kinds of uh, uh, sanctions on exports of key technology to China, and similarly, the China China has done the same thing on 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 their side. Uh, if you look at the 5G, for instance, uh, China, you know, has the most number of patents in, in, in this particular area, uh, followed by Korea and then the European Union and the United States is, is relatively small slice. So you, the US have really uh, fallen behind in, in this particular area of uh, technology. <clears throat> the one area where the US is ahead is in the uh, you know, semiconductor, the chips. And there, uh, of course, China is relatively advanced in terms of design, but they are dependent on the supply chain to produce the, the, the chip itself, the fabrication of the chip. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the uh, production use technology that are US based or European based. And so now, of course, they're having a hard time trying to get uh, <clears throat> To fabricate the chip because the the TSMC, you know, the most advanced chip, chip fabrication plant, has been uh, you know asked not to not to uh, supply well Huawei. It, it's not it's not to all the companies, uh, at, but to all the so what what the US has listed as a national security type of uh, uh, companies. And so now the Chinese are determined to, you know, uh, to, to build up their, develop their own capability to produce the, the chips on their own. But that's going to take a long time because it's not just the, uh, the fabrication itself, but also the machines uh, that produce the, 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 the chips and also some of the, uh, the software which are used for design itself. And then the ingredients that comes from uh, Japan so, you know, that's a, it will take them, I think, uh, sometime before they are able to catch up. 
but they are definitely uh, you know uh, expending a lot of uh, resources in that area. And I think just recently we also heard that the Japanese have decided that they, they need to also build up their capability or capacity in, in chip production in order to uh, you know remain more resilient. Um, so this is an area where you know it's, it's, it's subject to competition. Uh, so I think that the, the concern that there could be a technology bifurcation is quite real. Uh, but the what it means is that you know a lot of uh, devices that are on different technology will not be able to uh, communicate with each other. So Internet of Things uh, will not work uh, when you have that. that, that when you have that kind of situation. But the, if, if, if the com competition is on the technology and not on the, on the standard itself, then it's, it's less of a, uh, of a loss in, in a sense, because there's a dead weight loss in terms of efficiency when you don't have, uh, when you have uh, different standards. Um, so, and this has happened before in the past, but what has happened in the past also is that over time, technology itself comes up with interface uh, technology so that, you, so that different devices can still communicate with each other over time. So it's, not, it's still not very clear to us uh, how damaging this uh, technology bifurcation will be in the long run, because uh, the markets are, are quite large. I mean, you know, uh, and, and, the, and so you, one can see this from the positive side, that there'll be more competition between the two different uh, technologies uh, and that may actually be, be good rather than being, because the, the nature of this type of technology is that you have a winner takes all, you know, and a monopolistic type of uh, situation. Uh, so with this bifurcation, it may mean simply that there'll be more competition in terms of technology, which, you know, and for most, most countries, the smaller countries, it doesn't really matter uh, because they're not going to be you know, competing at that level but they'll be able to get the, the benefit of better technology because of the competition between the two uh, giants. <clears throat> um, so our takeaway from, from the study, you know, is that uh, so far we have not seen any wholesale reshoring or nearshoring of manufacturing out of the region. Uh, most MNCs basically have taken the uh, approach that, you know, they may have a China plus one strategy where they diversify away from uh, exclusive dependence on China. But when they do move, uh, they tend to move to the ASEAN region also. So the ASEAN region also because it's growing rapidly is, is an attraction, not just because of a, you know, a location for production and export, but also as a market in itself. Uh, and also the, you know, we see the, the, the bigger uh, <coughs> driver of, uh, the restructuring of the global value chain will come from technology rather than from this uh, trade conflict. Uh, because no matter uh, what, uh, the, the global value chain is just too massive, uh, you know, to be fully insured. Uh, the cost, the debt weight loss uh, of insuring your, your supply chain completely is going to be too high for any government. But most government will try to insure uh, maybe critical uh, you know, strategic products uh, key, you know, uh, components if, if necessary in order to build up some, uh, you know, resilience. And they also build up inventory or reserve of, of those products. But most of the product that are out there in the market, they will not be subject to this, uh, you know, uh, rivalry between the US and China. So we feel that, you know, while there will be definitely a, a shift towards uh, greater resilience, so trying to diversify your suppliers and building up reserve, there will be no uh, massive uh, restructuring of the global value chain. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the, the disruption, also more recently, we've seen that disruption is coming, uh, you know, can come from anywhere. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, the fire in, in Japan that caused the shutdown of the chip. We have the blizzard in Texas that did the same thing. Uh, so, so disruption can come from anywhere. And it's important to build up resilience, but the way to build up resilience is to diversify and build up, uh, you know, higher inventory. So a, a slight shift away from the old focus on efficiency and just on time to, 
you know, resilient, which is just in case. So you need to have, you know, uh, uh, multiple suppliers. <clears throat> Uh, finally, I, I think our view on the technology uh, war is that it may lead to bifurcation, but uh, we are still, but we, you know, we cautiously optimistic that it will not be really that damaging on the global economy as long as fairly targeted, and you know, it doesn't lead to a, you know, a complete uh, <clears throat> a disruption of the global value chain, and that seems to be the case at the moment. Because uh, if you look at the, the sanctions that's been imposed, in, it's been pretty narrow. And, and just recently, TikTok was taken off the list again uh, in the US. You know, uh, so as long as it remains targeted, I, you know, we, we feel that uh, countries like uh, ASEAN countries may even benefit from this uh, rivalry between the two uh, big giants. <clears throat> so let me stop here, uh, I think. Mm, thanks, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Hui, for that very comprehensive uh, overview to the audience. Uh, uh, I just want to like like to remind you that you can uh, post your questions to Hoi, to Manu, uh, uh, or, or to the panel more generally uh, in the Q and A box. Uh, if you're using, if you're watching us on on, on Zoom, uh, just to kick off that question session going, and I'll get you to answer this, uh, Hoi, after Manu has commented. Uh, can you say something about the prospects of convergence? Uh, as these global value chains uh, are reconfigured. Obviously, global value chains help places like China, countries like China, catch up very quickly uh, with developed countries. As these value chains are reconfigured and as technology takes, and, and as these value chains are digitalized, as you have uh, explained in your presentation, what are the likely implications for the growth prospects, right? the development prospects of, say, the Southeast Asian countries, especially uh, places that have not benefited as much uh, uh, in, 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 in the last 30 years with, with technology catch up. Uh, so so uh, uh, is this reconfiguration of global value chains likely to be a plus for economic convergence or is it likely to lead to uh, uh, divergence uh, rather than convergence? So, so I'll, I'll ask you to answer that uh, during the Q&A and as, as well as we might have more questions at that time also. So, but maybe in the meantime, I should ask Manu to uh, respond and to discuss uh, OE's uh, presentation. Over to you, Manu. Thank you. Um, let me first thank uh, Donald and the Institute for inviting me to speak and for organizing this uh, event. Secondly, I'd like to thank uh, Amro <clears throat> for a very comprehensive chapter on this whole issue. And it's a very important issue that will uh, <clears throat> shape a lot of things of interest to us in the coming years. In the short time I have, I thought I'd focus on uh, two issues. <clears throat> One is um, where ASEAN, what role ASEAN might play in all these changes that might come. And secondly, what are the implications for Hong Kong since uh, many of the audience are uh, from Hong Kong. <clears throat> so uh, let me first of all <clears throat> uh, review the parts of the AMRO report that uh, feed into these two uh, arguments that I'll be making. And I really uh, meant it when I uh, said that AMRO should be congratulated for the, uh, for the work it's done because it's covered an immense uh, <clears throat> lot of ground and it provides us with a bird's eye view of the factors that will shape uh, this reconfiguration of activity uh, in, in this whole uh, region. And it, it's covered such a broad range of uh, topics, uh, including uh, the likelihood of technological bifurcation, which will certainly be quite important. But I think there are <clears throat> two sets of findings in the AMRO report that are of particular interest to the points I want to make. One is that um, the pace of uh, reconfiguration uh, in the sense of relocation of activity out of China right now is still quite limited. <clears throat> and uh, the AMRO report looks at a few reasons why there is this stickiness, right? And they talk about the deep uh, ecosystem that China has built, which is very hard to replicate, and that I completely agree with. Um, <clears throat> and also the MNC's relationships with the suppliers in that ecosystem, the cost of switching uh, location and partners would therefore be very high. Um, there are also soft and hard infrastructure issues. And of course, as uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kaur pointed out, uh, people are now investing in China for the domestic market. So to a certain extent, it's not surprising that surveys of MNEs in China 
show very few intending to relocate out of China. Uh, many of the <clears throat> European and American MEs in China went there to serve the domestic market. So it's not uh, a surprise in a sense that they do not want to move. Uh, they are there to serve a domestic market and it's best served by product producing in China. Um, <clears throat> the second set of uh, findings in the Amber report, which are which is quite useful, is how uh, that heat map, which I think is very well constructed, and how it shows, um, for instance, that Malaysia is very well positioned within uh, the region to capture some of the relocation that might occur, but also how ASEAN is very well positioned relative to the competing emerging market uh, regions, uh, such as uh, Eastern Europe, uh, North Africa, like Morocco, Turkey, and uh, Mexico. <clears throat> um, so th those are two important things to bear in mind. So let me now um, shift and, and ask ourselves, what does the evidence actually show in terms of uh, relocation of activity? So if you look at the investment approval data uh, across <clears throat> ASEAN, for instance, what you see is actually exactly what AMRO found, which is very little evidence of uh, a relocation process. Um, in Indonesia, there, is, uh, there are some signs of an increase in relocation activity, but generally uh, the pattern is one of uh, uh, one, one that repeats what was evident before, no big change, right? Um, <clears throat> when we look at the anecdotal evidence, uh, it's a bit more interesting. We, we uh, painstakingly went through all the media reports, company uh, announcements of relocation for the last few years. And what you see is <clears throat> there was indeed evidence of relocation um, in 2018, 2019, as uh, the world uh, saw the you know, trade war become, becoming more uh, obvious and some companies became more and more concerned. Um, <clears throat> uh, what the evidence then shows is that as the pandemic hit, uh, all these news reports really dried up. It was quite clear that multinational enterprises were not prepared to make big decisions on reconfiguration reconfiguring their production setups in a period of great uncertainty, right? They're probably gonna wait until that uncertainty is over before they do anything more. But one thing does come across and that is that there is more and more evidence of greater and greater interest in India. It's surprising given what has happened to India in the last year, but nevertheless, that's what the evidence shows. Despite all its weaknesses, India is becoming more attractive um, for global production activities for a number of reasons, right? So <clears throat> that's what the uh, evidence as limited as it is uh, show. The next thing I want to look at is try to think about what can shape the decision-making of these large global corporations. Uh, so once the uncertainty uh, you know, begins to diminish and companies start re re rethinking their post-COVID strategy, uh, what will shape that decision on where to go, right? So <clears throat> the first thing I think we could think of is a kind of portfolio approach. And my hypothesis is that in the late 1990s, as China was about to enter the WTO and as evidence began to build up of China's great transformation, um, multinational companies looked at their portfolio of production, reloca uh, of production locations and realized that they had too little in China and probably quite a lot in ASEAN. But then remember, the late 90s were a terrible period for ASEAN. We had the Asian financial crisis. Uh, many of these Southeast Asian economies that had initially begun to move up very rapidly were devastated politically, financially, economically um, in dismal condition, right? So not surprisingly, <clears throat> the next few years saw this huge shift in the portfolio towards more and more production relocations in China and uh, not so much new locations in uh, ASEAN. In fact, in the case of Indonesia for a few years, there was actually negative FDI flows and people were pulling out of Indonesia, right? So what I want to suggest is that I suspect that once the crisis we have currently fades, multinational enterprises will do another portfolio reallocation 
<clears throat> they will look at a number of factors, the trade war, uh, the growing geopolitical discord, um, changing costs. And I suspect um, they will uh, reconfigure. And I also suspect some of that reconfiguration will be out of uh, China and a lot of it will benefit ASEAN. The second uh, way of looking at it is to look at the various processes that underpin this relocation. There are a number of things, as uh, <coughs> Dr. Koa pointed out, one thing that is still continuing is the process of inward location into China because of China's uh, extraordinary uh, potential as a consumer market, but also because as it gained economies of scale over the last 20 years, economies of scale, economies of scope, uh, China has actually become super competitive in a, a lot of uh, niches of production, including production of components. And you can see over the last 10 years, for instance, ASEAN's exports of electronic components to China have weakened considerably as China built up its own domestic capacity uh, there. So <clears throat> this inward uh, uh, location, you know, uh, relocation into China will continue, right? It's not that China is going to lose out. China moves up the value chain. It vacates some uh, areas of activity which then can move out somewhere else, but it also starts to occupy other areas and, and, and compete with other countries in the process. So you have that inward uh, movement into China. And within China, where uh, certain activities are beginning to lose a uh, competitive edge, there are a number of reactions. Companies could vacate certain niches that are labor intensive and move up the value add ladder, or they could move internally within China away from the costly coastal locations more inward, right? Or Chinese companies themselves could move out of China. So a number of uh, <clears throat> possibilities for Chinese-based uh, producers. But then you have another situation where because of technological change, like the 3D printing, for instance, that Dr. Kaur mentioned, which allows for mass customization, and because of changing <clears throat> consumer preferences and so on, it might make sense for certain products that uh, production be based near the big market. So in those cases where near shoring makes sense, uh, countries like um, Mexico could benefit on the doorstep of the US and with the USMCA treaty allowing it great access to that market. Or countries like Morocco or Turkey, which uh, have customs union arrangements with a huge market of the European Union. Um, and those regions might benefit vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN, which is further away and not so much on the, on the edge of a huge developed and rich market. <clears throat> uh, or you could get reshoring where technological change actually makes it possible for certain niches of production that used to be competitively produced in a developing country to now be competitively produced in the developed country. And 3D printing plays a role there as, as well. But where there is scope for continued offshoring, and I believe that there's considerable scope for continued offshoring, i.e. Uh, locating production in a cheaper place in an emerging e economy region, then I think ASEAN still benefits hugely. So with that in mind, what are ASEAN's prospects? And I want to make an argument that um, if political risks do not uh, intrude, I think ASEAN is really well positioned to improve its competitiveness in attracting um, <clears throat> uh, production away from other regions into it. Why do I say that? Well, when you look at um, <clears throat> what has, has been happening in ASEAN, over the uh, last uh, decade or so, you can see uh, in fits and starts, certainly, um, a series of changes, uh, reforms that are improving its supply side fundamentals. So you have, for instance, in Indonesia, labor market reforms in the uh, shape of the omnibus uh, reform bills that were just passed that uh, addresses some of the concerns that foreign investors had about uh, uh, labor market in, in Indonesia, you've got a huge push for infrastructure spending. And you will recall that poor infrastructure was uh, a major factor behind why ASEAN lost its uh, competitive edge. 
Uh, but if you look at Indonesia and Philippines, both huge laggards in that area, they have increased their uh, public sector infrastructure spending as a proportion of GDP by one and a half to two percentage points of GDP uh, in the last few years before the COVID crisis hit. So what we're seeing is in terms of uh, the business ecosystem, ease of doing business, and all these areas, uh, you know, caps on foreign investment and so on, that the region as a whole is gradually becoming more and more attractive once again to foreign investors. And uh, as its fundamentals improve, I think ASEAN will see more uh, production moving to the region. At the same time, its uh, standing relative to China improves uh, for partly for political reasons. Uh, the US-China discord does not help China. And also, if you look at the latest uh, census uh, uh, that China just released, uh, it is quite clear that China's demographic transition is occurring faster uh, than expected. And multinational enterprises will look at that in uh, deciding their long-term uh, production location strategy. So I, I do believe that um, ASEAN is well poised to see a significant uh, acceleration in uh, inward flows of foreign investment as part of the supply chain reconfiguration. Now, very quickly, um, let me just conclude by uh, with some thoughts on what does it mean for Hong Kong. Uh, I think it's an, actually an opportunity uh, for Hong Kong uh, to exploit. Um, <clears throat> uh, but Hong Kong can only do this if it uh, embarks on the right strategy. Right? Uh, Hong Kong has certain uh, competitive edge. Uh, it is a great uh, financial center. It has uh, <clears throat> uh, tremendous knowledge of the Chinese market. So it can work with Southeast Asia very well, but it needs to differentiate itself from the competing cities in China. It's got to build on its existing role as really um, uh, a leader in terms of understanding Southeast Asia compared to its competitors in China, like Shanghai or Guangzhou. Um, and I think if it maintains this differentiation, um, it has a lot to build on and it can become an important gateway uh, for Chinese investments to flow to Southeast Asia and for Southeast Asian um, activity to flow to uh, China. Of course, in doing so, there is a, a, a great competitor called Singapore, which is positioned at the heart of uh, um, ASEAN. So the other element of Hong Kong's strategy will be to uh, ensure that it moves into the niches which Singapore is not so uh, efficient or competent in, for instance, equity market financing where Singapore has completely lost the game, right? So <clears throat> I think um, that's basically what I wanted to say, uh, Donald, uh, and I'll hand back to you now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Manu, uh, for that you know, very uh, thoughtful and uh, provocative responses. So maybe I can ask both of you, what, what, what does it all mean for convergence prospects? You know, when we talk about relocation out of China as if it were a bad thing, but as we all know, when it comes to global value chains, you know, the flying geese theory, right? Relocation is actually good for the development prospects of economies that are uh, just below the, the, the country that's doing the relocation. So if, if so for instance, if Chinese authorities hold on to these uh, manufacturing uh, investments and hope production facilities, especially these are increasingly, uh, you know, in areas where China no longer has a comparative advantage, for instance, in cheap electronics, textiles and garments, that actually hurts the development prospects of the likes of Vietnam and Philippines and Indonesia and Cambodia. Uh, so, you know, we speak about relocation as if it were a bad thing, but my argument would be that we want to see more relocation, uh, particularly to the less developed parts of, uh, of the ASEAN plus three region. Uh, Hoi, how would you respond to this provocation? <laughs> no, I think that has been happening, right? We, we know that. Huh? Um, and it's been going on for several years now. I mean, Cambodia uh, is an obvious uh, beneficiary in Vietnam, right? Uh, I mean, much of Vietnam, Vietnam really took off only after 2007 when they joined the, the WTO and Samsung made a decision to invest in, in Vietnam, right? And that started, you know, uh, the, the whole pro process of a massive investment into Vietnam and it became a, a major manufacturing hub. Uh. But Vietnam is at one extreme, I mean, an extremely successful case of moving up the, uh, I mean, the, the flying geese. But the complaint of Vietnam is that 
they are benefiting from the low end, right? And they want to move up to the high end. And so, you know, much of the intermediate inputs are still being shipped from Korea down to uh, uh, Vietnam rather than being pr produced in Vietnam itself. And even the ones that are produced in Vietnam are Korean uh, uh, SMEs who decided to move to Vietnam to, you know, to supply the, uh, to, uh, to produce the intermediate inputs for the, the main, uh, uh, I mean, it's just like a, a semiconductor company, you have all this, the supply, you know, that comes in. Uh, but this is a process that we know Malaysia went through, Singapore went through, right? Uh, you need to build up capability over time. And it does happen. I mean, look at Viet look at like Thailand. Thailand is a good example where initially they attracted all the assembly operation for the cars, but now they have uh, Thai, uh, in Thai companies that are world-class producer of auto parts, okay? Uh, and that has happened because, you know, the government has invested heavily in terms of the uh, you know uh, <clears throat> R&D to help their own local manufacturers move up the, the, the value chain. So I think something similar will happen to Vietnam particularly, you know? because Vietnam, I think it's for, it's so much energy, <laughs> so much uh, uh, create, you know, uh, uh, expertise there that they, they are like, I think the other countries have taken a look at Vietnam and found that they sort of miss out. And this is why I, I think Manu's point about omnibus law in, in Indonesia is important. Uh, because I think they're finally trying to fix the, the, the main impediment to, for FDI to come in. Of course, Indonesia is a big domestic market, and so they were able to get away with it for a while, uh, especially when commodity prices was booming. You said that it's, they started to uh, hollow out in the, in the late uh, 20, 2010, 2011, but that was when commodity prices was booming. And so they took advantage of that. And they, I think, unfortunately, they became quite close, uh, the economy. So they only invited the uh, FDI into Indonesia that produced for domestic market rather than, you know, for exports, right? Uh, but I think that there's been a shift in strategy now. Uh, they realized that um, commodity prices have sort of uh, fallen off the cliff, although now it's big, picking up again. <laughs> Hopefully, they don't go back, go back to the commodity boom type of uh, strategy. Um, but in any case, I, I think, you know, ASEAN is a very diverse region, you know, right? We have the CLMB countries that are de developing, that are able to benefit from this uh, in relocation of, uh, you know, yeah. lower cost labor type of industry. Then you have the middle income countries like Malaysia, that really wants to move up, you know, but uh, in, a, some, in a sense, they're stuck because uh, they don't, they're not producing enough of the uh, skilled labor to be, but, you know, I think Malaysia, for all is 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 failing, <laughs> shortcoming has been able to you know gradually move up the, the, the scale, and they are very they are very mindful of the fact that this is an opportunity, as you said, uh, you know when I think that for, as 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 you saw on the, on on the chart, I think China is only now beginning to uh, move invest abroad in terms of manufacturing, in terms of services and other. In the past, they've been investing mostly in the natural resource industry, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they are very formidable there, but they don't really go into manufacturing. But now they are, their own industries are moving out to, to take advantage of lower costs in the region. And also be, in the services sector, you know, it's a very different ball game. It's not, uh, you know, um, you need to be there physically, but a, a lot of it has to be done locally. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the uh, employment is going to be created. So there will be convergence, I think, you know, and this could yeah. be an opportunity where you see a massive shift of uh, relocation from China and also you know, investment from China into the region. Uh, but, you know, countries really have to, you know, uh, position themselves and, and, you know, and, and try to attract the FDI in, into, into the country. <clears throat> Thanks. I, I agree with you on CLMV countries. Uh, well, not so much Myanmar and Laos, but certainly on Cambodia and Vietnam, they are actually very well positioned to absorb and take in some of these relocation that might occur as part of the portfolio reallocation that Manu was talking about. If Manu, I can turn to you and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and pick up on Malaysia, and the middle yeah. income one, Malaysia, Thailand, yeah. even Indonesia, because around the same time that the EMRO put out this report, there was also a World Bank report uh, called the Innovation Imperative in Developing East Asia. And yeah. The central argument of that report was that with the exception of China, uh, Technology development and diffusion, not just invention, mm. but diffusion, 
in developing Asia has been relatively slow. Yeah. While that might not hurt the developing lower income countries, that certainly hurts right the kind the likes of Malaysia. And Hoi and I are both ex-Malaysians, so you know it's always you know been a source yeah. of uh, frustration. Yeah. Now it's yeah. not been able to catch up yeah. much faster. Yeah. So in light of that, in light of that World Bank observation mm. that mm. innovation capabilities, technology development yeah. capabilities are weak in this. Uh, ASEAN middle-income countries, Malaysia, Thailand included. Mm -hmm. Are you still as optimistic about ASEAN being this giant magnet? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I still am. Um, but, but first of all, let me just uh, uh, just cover a couple of points uh, for the earlier question. Uh, you know, your question. This is not a zero-sum game. Yeah. It is very much in the interest of uh, China uh, to see this relocation. I mean, remember the whole point of uh, economic development is to be to become uncompetitive in the low end. So that you can pay your workers higher wages, right? And if you do that, then obviously you move uh, stuff out. And if you look at uh, Singapore uh, versus uh, uh, the Batam region of south of uh, Indonesia, Batam is just 25 kilometers south of uh, Singapore. Uh, Singapore transferred the equivalent of about one third of its manufacturing capacity uh, from Singapore to Batam in the space of just four or five years, starting in about 1988 and ending about 1993, 94. Um, and it was tremendously beneficial to Singapore because it released uh, scarce land and uh, labor resources for that allowed Singapore to move up the value chain, enjoy very high rates of growth. And it was fantastic for the Riau uh, province um, of uh, Indonesia because it created a new manufacturing hub. And that manufacturing hub in Batam then began to assemble services uh, as well. It was a fantastic story. And if we can replicate that kind of relocation then it's it's a it's a positive sum game um, <clears throat> and everyone benefits. But then the second point I want to make, which uh, then addresses the point you raised earlier, is um, <clears throat> it's not such a straightforward process, right? Um, <clears throat> countries must get their basics correct. If they do, then they benefit, right? So Vietnam did a lot of the right things, particularly in terms of having lots of free trade agreements, connectivity with the rest of the world access to lots of markets and that made it very very attractive <clears throat> to foreign investors but it didn't get everything else right in the corporate sector in the financial sector i mean we can go on for a long time for this but the, the short uh, point is that vietnam did not get those things right in in, in terms of uh, its own corporate sector development and its financial sector development and because of that it could not attract <clears throat> um you know companies that came in and built an ecosystem which then hired vietnamese uh, uh, SMEs and so on, and then you get the spillover effects. But uh, Singapore did that. Singapore, with its ec economic development board and all that, there was a conscious effort in the 1980s, unfortunately less so now, but in the 1980s, 1970s, to create a cadre of Singapore SMEs, which then grew into big companies, and then you had the spillover benefit. So a lot really depends on industrial policy, getting industrial policy right. Um, in Malaysia and Thailand's case, I think there's one additional problem which I suspect is um, holding the countries back. And that is that both countries open their labor markets uh, to both legal and unfortunately illegal uh, cheap foreign workers. And if companies have access to cheap foreign labor, why would they do the hard work of innovating to raise productivity, restructuring? It's tough, right? It's the easy thing to do, what I call lazy growth, is to just rely on cheap foreign workers. And so you have millions of uh, Myanmar and others in Thailand, millions of Indonesians and also some Filipinos, uh, and even Nepalese and Bangladeshis in uh, Malaysia. I, I think that was a, a grievous uh, a strategic error. And I think that probably uh, explains part of the slowness of innovation development mm -hmm. in those two countries. Yeah, this is a good point for me to raise one of the questions on the panel uh, specific to Singapore, because Singapore also has had some of that uh, cheap foreign labor problem. Uh, and so the question was, you know, after the pandemic, I mean, during, I mean recently Singapore announced the establishment or is going to attract uh, uh, these vaccine production uh, factories in, in, in Singapore, <coughs> something which I'm sure Hong Kong also wishes to have, but Hong Kong has, you know, pretty much hollowed out this yeah. manufacturing sector. Uh, so for high labor cost places like, like Singapore, like Hong Kong, uh, how would they, would they benefit at all from, from you know, how, how would they look in that, for instance, in that heat map, in terms of the, uh, the transfer, transferability of the GBCs? I noticed, for instance, uh, for Hong Kong, 
the only to, to the extent that it appeared on the you know the the the, the McKinsey question there, what are you moving out of China? Hong Kong only appeared for business services. Of course, it is a professional services hub. So that explains, but nothing else does HQ and business services. That's where it appears, but nothing else, not in manufacturing, not in, you know, not even in logistics where Hong Kong has a comparative advantage. So how, how would the two hub cities of Singapore and Hong Kong fare in this post pandemic reconfiguration of uh, global value chains? Maybe start with Hoi. Uh, well, you know, we know that manufacturing, manufacturing is increasingly becoming more and more technology and capital intensive, right? So I think the labor cost component is going to be getting less and less significant okay. as, a, as an attraction for you know, manufacturing to come to Singapore. Uh, so it'd be you know, much more sort of a uh, intangible type of uh, uh, asset that you, you need to build up intellectual property rights, you know, governance system, yeah. whether you have an R&D, whether you have subsidy support, <laughs> your tax regime uh, and so I think because of that, I, Singapore has been able to attract recently some of the you know uh, manufacturing uh, high-end operations. Yeah. Some Singapore, right? Uh, for instance, the EVs, the hydrogen, and then more recently the biotech. Uh, so I mean, even during the pandemic, although there were a reduction in, in labor in manufacturing, production actually went up, right? <laughs> I mean, it's becoming much more capital intensive or, or technology intensive. So I, I think that it's become less less important. I think the more important is that the Singapore has made a conscious decision that it wants to keep, keep the manufacturing sector, right? Whereas uh, Hong Kong has decided that it's, you know, it's going to move the manufacturing to Shenzhen and Shenzhen has benefited enormously from, from that uh, relocation. That's a correction. That goal, it's, not a, it's not that Hong Kong has decided to move, it's just that <laughs> Hong Kong authorities don't It was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, and but you know they are, I mean for a long time I guess you know because they are still the owner I mean they may benefit from the investment income but you know I haven't followed this very closely but in any case I think Hong Kong's role is very specific right. it's, it's part of bigger China and the Chinese have a plan for China, for Hong Kong where it fit into the big, greater Bay Area you know the hinterland and it wants to China I mean use Hong Kong as a as a way to modernize the financial sector I would say. And also to you know, so I, I think the, the, the Chinese uh, see a, a role for Hong Kong, and, and unless Hong Kong take a more sort of industrial policy approach to to development, it will you know it will just go flow with the market, right? Uh, with market forces, and the market forces dictate that you know it continue to, to move into the services sector. I mean, the services sector. Uh, you talk about logistics. Actually, logistics is still very big in, in Hong Kong. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, I was surprised it didn't appear at all in that. Uh, <laughs> no. Maybe they're no. so saturated already. There's not I much. Mean, the, the most, the more recent upswing in, in, in Hong Kong was really because of logistics. Yeah. You know? uh, the fact that China's uh, trade has a uh, boom, and and Hong Kong is is intermediary between the, the trade, you know, uh, yeah. between China and, and the U.S. and other places, so that gave a lift to, to the export sector. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I. I mean, I, I, I think... I think this is where you're... I think you're right, Hoi. This is where the two diverge. Yeah. I mean, Singapore has been far more deliberate in using industrial policy to anchor or even to upgrade its manufacturing sector. Hong Kong has been far more in this respect laissez-faire, right? Would you yeah. agree, with me that, that I mean, this is yeah. your point about industrial policy and government yeah. getting, getting the basics right, right? Yeah, I, I think... Um... <clears throat> You know, you can't just leave everything to the market. Well, you can, but then you, you have to live with the consequences, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think Hui has actually covered a lot of the ground, but I want to say one thing. I think, you know, when we talk about reconfiguration of supply chains and all that, a lot of the conversation is really about um, manufacturing. But I think when we talk about Hong Kong and Singapore, essentially they are <clears throat> global financial and business hubs. And I think there's a reconfiguration going on in terms of the structure of competitiveness of global business hubs. Because <clears throat> first, you've got this big change, uh, Brexit, <clears throat> that uh, will affect Hong, uh, London's position uh, in some way or other, right? It's still not very clear, but <clears throat> I think um, to some extent, London will lose uh, competitive edge in certain niches. And actually what we've noticed is that there are one or two things actually moving, uh, strangely enough, uh, from London to Singapore. You would have thought they'd 
move from London to Amsterdam or Dublin, but some, some stuff is actually moving to, to Singapore. Singapore has benefited from Brexit in that sense, right? But the bigger uh, point for Singapore and Hong Kong is, is the competition between the two. And um, of course, in some um, senses, uh, Singapore is said to benefit because of the political changes affecting Hong Kong. There's this talk about uh, talent, particularly from the West, uh, not feeling safe or secure in Hong Kong and preferring to locate in Singapore. And that, to be honest, has benefited Singapore. Things that um, flow into the, um, uh, that, you know, derive from the rule of law or its perception, I think there has been some benefit for Singapore. So there's a reconfiguration going on. Now, Singapore cannot sit on its laurels because there's another big change happening. Hong Kong is embedded in the Greater Bay Area. That's uh, uh, going to be a, a massive urban agglomeration which will give tremendous economies of scale and scope for Hong Kong, um, which Singapore cannot even begin to dream of. Um, Hong Kong can tap into this 100 million plus population, several trillion dollars of GDP growing rapidly uh, with all the benefits of the Chinese market there as well. And it can gradually take more and more stuff away from Singapore over time in terms of aviation activity, in terms of logistics activity, the financial service activity, uh, if Singapore is not careful. And you know, in certain areas, Singapore has already lost the game. Uh, as I referred to earlier in the equity market uh, area, it's, I think the game has already gone to um, Hong Kong. And one day, Singapore will probably be a smaller market than even Manila or Bangkok. <laughs> Okay, just one more Sorry. question. There was a question. <laughs> uh, You're biased. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I would disagree with Manu in, in some way. You know, I agree that Hong Kong is split into this greater Bay Area. Right? So the, the role of Hong Kong is, is very sort of side, uh, China focused, you know. Uh, and as you said, equity is a big, but that's because all the big Chinese companies are listing in Hong Kong, not in Singapore. We get the Katan Pute, right? Uh, but, if, at all, if at all, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the advantage of Singapore is that you are in a bigger hinterland, right? And that's what you should take advantage of. I think, yeah. I mean, we are after a small country. We, you don't have to, you know, be too ambitious in yeah. order to, yeah. you know, uh, but you need to be pick what you, what you want to focus on. And you have India and then you have China and then you have the US, right? So if you play, your, if you play the game right, I think you can benefit from the fact that you are not just plugged into one particular uh, mm -hmm. area, but you are able to benefit from all the different parts. Eh? But what, what worries me actually is that, you know, this anti uh, xenophobia type of uh, mentality that is yeah. you know, taking hold in, in, in Singapore, where, you know, we, you know, <laughs> the, the turning against foreigner, the foreign labor. I mean, the fact of the matter is Singapore is so small. We, if you don't have foreign worker, it cannot grow at yeah. all, right? Yeah. So you need to, to decide how, how fast you're going to grow. And what kind of area you want to grow in, and then you know leverage on that. Uh, but I don't think the competition with Hong Kong is, 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 is you know, I mean, there's enough space for both yeah. <laughs> cities yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that was Manu's point also. Uh, Hong Kong being this gateway, you know, be between the Greater Bay Area for investments going to Southeast Asia and vice versa. I mean, this is a role that only Hong Kong can play. Yeah, Singapore can't be that gateway, yeah. right? True, true, sure. no, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but there was a question about RCEP. So Singapore is part of RCEP, Hong Kong is not. But more broadly, how do you think, how do both of you think that RCEP would facilitate that re relocation or reconfiguration of uh, global value chain? Uh, obviously, I think Singapore is going to benefit from, to the extent that, you know, uh, RCEP gives a flip, gives a boost to this reconfiguration, not just, you know the other Southeast Asian countries, but certainly as a hub city, Singapore would benefit for any from any uh, trade flows, capital flows uh, that are product of RCEP. Hong Kong is not, or at least not yet, a part of uh, RCEP. Uh, I, I certainly think Hong Kong should be. But what 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 do both of you think? What would be the boost of RCEP to hubs like Singapore? You want to go ahead, or should I start? Uh, go ahead, Manu. Yeah. Oui. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, our uh, you know, we did we did a simulation recently of the benefit of our set by you know uh, looking at the tariff. I mean, as it turns out, tariffs are already very low. Already There's very not low. much benefit that you're going to get from tariff. You know, reducing the tariff more. 
uh, the the beef in RCEP really is is in services sector, e-commerce, you know, some of this uh, intent uh, area. And so, if you, for instance, the, the single window uh, where you facilitation of trade across the region, that's that's important if you can get it going, right? So, uh, whereas in terms of tariff barrier, as we know, um, if you can prevent non-tariff barrier from coming in, coming up you know, or increasing in the region, that that's, a, that's an achievement. Uh, but it's just you know, it, it's a, it's like a hygiene factor. You improve it bit more, right? And then because the region is growing uh, rapidly, anyway, you are then able to leverage on this, you know, even more uh, in terms of the benefit of say seamless payment across across the the, the, the region, uh, in terms of investment, uh, attracting more investment from from the from the from the other country, and and then leverage on the complementarities in the region because Singapore, as you know needs to basically, you know, like Manu said, at some point decide what are the industries you need to move out of Singapore in order to be able to create space for other other things, right? And all this, I think, you know, with a, with a framework like RCEP or CPTPP, I think it provides, you know, a, a better type of a frame, a environment for, you know, for the businessmen to do that kind of a strategic uh, you know, re readjustment, you know? Hmm. Maybe I, I should just add uh, to that. I mean, I agree with Hui. Um, I don't think we should just look at RCEP. I mean, there are lots of games going on, right? I mean, you have RCEP, you also have CPTPP, which Singapore is also a member of. Um, <clears throat> you have uh, other modes of integration in the region. Um, you have the uh, Greater Mekong sub-region, which I think has been actually phenomenally successful, but that helps the northern part of ASEAN, not so much the, the archipelago. And you've got um, the ASEAN Economic Community, which some people poo-poo, but really over time, it, I think it will become more and more important. So in the context of all this, I think um, <clears throat> what you're going to see is gradual uh, opening up. So despite the sort of uh, globalization uh, that's going on around us, uh, in terms of regional trade, I suspect <clears throat> regional trade, regional investment, regional people movements, uh, I think you'll see a a pickup. So in that context, I think um, all these countries are going to, to benefit. But I think um, the big winners, <clears throat> I suspect, will be those that manage to improve connectivity more rapidly than others. And I think Vietnam and Singapore are well ahead of the game in that respect. Vietnam and Singapore both <clears throat> had a conscious strategy of maximizing their free trade agreements, economic partnership agreements, even uh, to the extent that they were prepared to make some sacrifices on the domestic side in order to achieve that. And I think by and large, it was probably the right uh, strategy. And I think those two countries will, will benefit from that. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that is becoming clearer is, uh, is, is, you know, how, you know, well, first the digitalization of manufacturing, second this shift to services. Uh, and and historically, services has been have been much traded much less uh, than 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 manufacturing. Uh, back to my original question about how Southeast Asia has not really been an exporter of <coughs> of uh, of services, right? Uh, even now, it, well, we we see the emergence now of these yeah. unicorns, but to a large extent, these are these still tend to be very local or at most regional, the likes of Grab. Uh, Whereas in China, uh, you've seen this quite, I mean, for a middle income country, which China still is, it's surprisingly a major exporter of right, services and technologies. Uh, how do you see that part of, you know, that, that, that part of the economy services uh, changing in light after the pandemic? I mean, Hoi, the, the reports you, you presented speaks a lot about uh, the, the shift to digital, right? And of course here, as I said, surprisingly, China is actually a, a leading producer, uh, very surprising for a middle income country. Whereas for the rest of uh, ASEAN plus three, even not just even Southeast Asia, but even Japan and South Korea, right? Okay, South Korea is, is probably that's much better. Uh, we, one is hard pressed to think of, you know, the kind of digital capabilities that it is truly, uh, that, that is truly globally competitive. Uh, do you think yeah. this might hurt them in the longer run? Yeah. Maybe if I, if I can come here, Donald, I mean, uh, you know, when you talk about services exports, it doesn't have to be the, the sexy technological stuff, right? Like digital or whatever. 
I mean, don't forget, in terms of business process outsourcing, uh, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam rank among the top tier. But that's going to be very automated very quickly, right? A lot no, parts of, of it. Parts of it. No, 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 not, not, not only parts of it. Some of it cannot be. Uh, yeah, some parts of it, um, the, the basic parts will get. But, you know, it, the, the studies show that there's a lot in, in these services that cannot be uh, so easily automated, okay. right? You just move up the value chain. So instead mm -hmm. of being a very basic radiographer, you go into interpreting um, you know, x-rays and all that. So, so there, there is still scope, I think. Um, <clears throat> so, um, it, so the point I'm making is that they have done well in some areas, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the gig economy, uh, what, what's happening, which is very difficult to quantify because the data is not there. Yeah. But in, in, Hong, in the Philippines, we estimate that there are about 2 million gig workers who work for the global market. In other words, they use the internet platforms um, to do work. Uh, which is service sector work and, and yeah. you know, thinking work uh, for a global market. And that's, mm -hmm. that's services export as well. And they are paid through informal channels, PayPal or whatever. So unfortunately, the, uh, the, 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 the good data is not there for us to do a proper analysis. But there is a lot of evidence from uh, the banking sector in the Philippines, for instance, that we've been talking to that shows that this is a big growth area. And I suspect if it's happening in the Philippines, you know, bright young Filipinos with energy, um, exploiting this, I, I'm sure that the hungry young Vietnamese, hungry young Malaysians will do the same as well. Yeah. So I, I think it's a rapidly changing mm. area. Hoi, are you equally optimistic about the prospects of services in being a, this major engine of uh, growth in the region? Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be the engine of growth uh, for most countries in the region, right? I mean, you mentioned Philippines, the BPO uh, service, for instance, uh, and, and for the Philippines, it's such a service economy compared to most of the other ASEAN countries uh, that they've been hit really hard this time around because of the pandemic. I mean, the shutdown effect on the Philippines is much greater than it has been on the other countries. And, but that's because it's very service oriented. The problem for the Philippines is that a lot of its uh, skilled service workers are overseas, right? Uh, they are <laughs> working overseas in Dubai, in, <laughs> in, in, in Europe, somewhere else rather than back home. So you actually have a shortage of skilled workers in the Philippines itself, you know, which is a, which is a shame. But, uh, but certainly I think the, the BPO will continue to expand and they, will, they are going to be upgraded to a BKO. But what, actually Manu, the, the point that you made about globalization of the services sector in the gig industry, I mean, that, that's basically the BPO, but it's, it, that's a more organized uh, sector. But you also have, have a lot of this uh, so-called freelancer yeah, that's what I meant. No, right. That's what I meant. We're now basically operating the, the global market independently in, in, yeah. the, in the own domestic market, right? Okay. And when you look at the, the Indonesia and actually the ASEAN countries, I mean the fact that you have Grab, e-commerce, Bookpedia, and all that, I think that's a very good sign that you know some of this technology, at least on the on the, on the application side, can be done indigenously. It doesn't have to be, you know. Uh, I mean the, the very high end technology, you know, like fabrication or that. I think. Uh, the, the region has sort of lost out <laughs> in the manufacturing space. Mm. But uh, in the services sector, I think there's a, there is a space for more creativity, you know, uh, and much more, it's more sort of a small scale, but it can be scaled up very quickly, right? Uh, so I think the kind of environment, skill set that you need for, to, to, to develop your, your services industry will be quite different. I think you have to look at the regulatory framework and make sure that they are not stifling. I mean, the, the problem for Japan, right, is that, you know, they, yeah. they're so old fashioned in the way they do things that even though they're the most advanced. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very funny. Literally, you know, they still need the seal in order to get it, the <laughs> things done, right? So man, some of these are really uh, um, um, bureaucracy or structural cultural factors that you need yeah. to, you know, change over time, yeah. Yeah, certainly there is a bias against services in places like Japan, but even in Vietnam, which has, you know, even though it's got all these large talent pool of, you know, computer engineers and all, it's not particularly encouraging of, uh, you know, these digital startups and all. I mean, Manu and I know, for instance, Grab has been, has had all sorts of uh, trouble in, in. So I think where, where, where governments emphasize manufacturing uh, and they have a bias for manufacturing. Sometimes that translates also, spills over into uh, mm. bias against uh, services. Uh, in fact, that was also highlighted in the World Bank report on the innovation imperative, that to the extent governments promote innovation and invest in R&D, it is very much oriented towards 
uh, manufacturing. I mean, general in, in Southeast Asia, generally there's inadequate investments in innovation and R&D. But to the extent that there is any, there is too much of a bias against uh, services. And, and, I mean, and, the one area, service area, which is still underexploited is tourism, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once they're able to open up fully, you know, I think there's going to yeah. be a boom in tourist uh, activity. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Although with the pandemic, God knows how long this will last. I, the <laughs> shape of tourism is going to look very different. longer than we all <laughs> expected. No, I, I think Hui is right. You know, I think uh, tourism also, and uh, we should not think of tourism only as low end. You know, I think Thailand has shown that with creativity, you can actually move up the value chain even in tourism. So Thailand encourages kind of gourmet uh, Thai food, uh, kind of tourism, uh, high level spas uh, for health reasons and all, and, and, and it worked. Right? So there's tremendous scope to move up the value add ladder, even in tourism. And I, I think it's the, it's the low hanging fruit, which we are not actually doing enough to exploit. Yeah. But having said that, uh, I can't think of a large economy of anything more than five or 10 million people where mm. tourism or, or even services more generally has been what brought them from developing to developed countries. Right. You need manufacturing. Yeah, as you still need a certain level of... Uh, well, the US has become <laughs> hollowed out. <laughs> yeah, but if, if that happened, that, that deindustrialization happened only after it got rich, right? Yeah. So, so, so there was a question from one of our attendees. Uh, how would Singapore and Singaporeans compete uh, with, you know, in the face of globalization of services? Singapore is also fast becoming a services-driven economy. Uh, and many of the things that, you know, with this digitalization, you can outsource it to anyone in the world. I mean, what, what Singapore's uh, comp comparative or competitive advantage going to be? Uh, yeah. You know, if we can, if, if all these services can be yeah. brought more cheaply yeah. over the net, right? Yeah. No, I can think, I, Christine, yeah. you, you have to find your competitive niche, which is the uh, customization of the services that you provide. Right. You know? uh, the sort of commoditized services. I mean, there is a role for that. Like BPO is basically commoditized service, right? Call center, you know. Mm -hmm. But even there, you can upgrade your service you, product, you provide, you know, in terms of the quality of the call service. And I think that has improved actually over time, uh, the call service. Or, or you could be the, the the one that built the platforms, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, Singapore has done reasonably well with creating all these uh, e-commerce platforms yeah. that are now going regional, right? But I, I think we can... Um, we can just pick up on what Hui said about customization. I think that's exactly it. You know, so you look at uh, Singapore's success in developing itself as a an arbitration center. It, it is really giving London a, a run for the money now. So you focus on an area where it's very high value add, um, <clears throat> and you understand what is needed in the ecosystem to make it successful, and it can work. So uh, Singapore, the entire uh, legal fraternity got together, and they really worked very hard at building this and uh, it's showing up in the numbers. The actual numbers show very decisively a big shift towards Singapore. So mm -hmm. I think we can, there are enough niches, like you said, Donald, we, small country, we don't need too many niches, right? To do well in. Uh, if we can identify a few niches like arbitration and mediation and so on, uh, we are fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. because costs are the, high. I think also the nature of services is that is you have the gig economy where, you know, your income is going to be relatively low so I think, you know, there's a role for the state to play to provide that, so, you know, uh, social safety. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. I think to the extent that the state wants to regulate or intervene in the gig economy is to provide that safety net. Right. Exactly. Rather than to make life more exactly. difficult for <laughs> these gig economies. Then economy. you encourage more people to go into the gig economy, yeah. be much more innovative, much more creative, right? right? Exactly. But you need the ecosystem to be in place in order to encourage that kind of a system, people to work That's there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think post-pandemic, when governments have to rethink social security, their welfare state, you know, providing for the gig economy, providing a safety net for mm. gig economy workers will be a, will be a, I mean, you know, the last time there was a major reconfiguration of the welfare state was after the second world war, right? When yeah. governments in, in, in Western Europe, in the US yeah. realized that the people who paid the biggest price, who made the biggest sacrifices mm. were people who were under protected, underserved. That's and that's right. why they constructed these uh, welfare states. I think, for many countries, the pandemic has been a kind of a war, right? And, and you realize yeah. that the people who make the yeah. bigger sacrifices, were, you know, for instance, not besides our health workers who have been mm. underpaid, are people also in the gig economy who are under, underserved and underprotected by public services. And I think that this rethink of the welfare state, this rethink of the role of the state in protecting the most vulnerable, protecting the most, uh, uh, yeah. the ones who, who have made the most sacrifices in, in our 21st century war, the mm. pandemic. Yeah. 
is is enormous, and 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 that that needs to be seriously uh, rethought. Yeah. So on that note, uh, I, I'm sure everybody will agree that we've benefited hugely from our two uh, speakers. Uh, so I want to, on behalf of uh, HKUST and the Institute of Emerging Market Studies, uh, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Koui and Manu Baskaran for giving us such an insightful uh, session. And I really hope that the next time we do this, we'll do this in person, maybe in Hong Kong or in Singapore. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Both of you can come to Hong Kong. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, It'd be live. great. It'd be great. Hong Kong. All the best to our Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for organizing this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thank yeah. you.